if you like betting on golf. But everyone that you back misses the cut, get some experts involved. With all the stats and the tips and so much more, cause it's the golf betting system, the golf betting system, it's the golf betting system. Greetings and welcome to the Golf Betting System Podcast 194, featuring the Farmers Insurance Open on the PGA Tour and the Dubai Desert Classic on the DP World Tour. Paul Williams and Barry O'Hanrahan join me, Steve Bamford, to discuss this week's golf betting action. Good morning, gentlemen. Morning, chaps. Morning, boys. Please subscribe to this podcast as you drive the popularity of the show. This podcast is for listeners of 18 and above. Please be gamble aware. You can visit BeGambleAware.org for more information and, of course, please bet responsibly. Visit our world-famous golf betting system website with our in-depth betting previews, strokes gained data, and that includes the DP World Tour now, masses of tournament form statistics and our predictor models, all available completely free of charge with no paywall. We are on Twitter. Paul is at Golf Betting. Barry is at A Good Talk Golf. I am at Bamford Golf. You can join our Golf Betting System Facebook group. The link is available in the description box. Plus, look out for the Steve Bamford Golf YouTube channel where I present the Golf Betting Show every week. Please subscribe and like the show. It's very important that, actually. I've I've got a crusade, chaps, and I I don't know if it's Mission Impossible. If I could get 3,000 subscribers by the time we get to the Masters on the Steve Bamford Golf YouTube channel, that would be absolutely fantastic. It's a, it's a, it's a stretch. Mm. I think we're 700 away. But if you are listening to the podcast and you've never been to the Steve Bamford Golf YouTube channel, I do a weekly show there on each PGA Tour event. So get yourself across and subscribe. Right. Five star review time. Um, I've got to say as well, you guys, you listeners have been absolutely fantastic. Spotify now. Um, we are up over 50 five stars ratings. So that's absolutely fabulous. Keep them coming because it just effectively shows the podcast platform how popular the show is. So uh, keep pressing that five star uh, rating button on uh, Spotify and keep your five star reviews coming in. I have to say, all of the reviews at the moment are coming from the United States of America. So thank you to our US listeners. So if you're in Canada, I know that we've got masses of listeners over in Australia. If you're in Ireland, if you're in the UK, spend 30 seconds, give us a five-star review. That would be absolutely fantastic. I'll read you this one from... uh, This one's from Eagles Trade for Heart. He's in the US of A. Classy show and a great listen. A must. Five stars. Guys, always classy and full of information. This is a good pod you can listen to driving your family around. Love the show. And then he's got this bit wrong, actually. He says, no more runner-up finishes for Steve Bamford. Lots of laughs. (laughs) You're wrong, Eagles, because, again, I landed another runner-up finish this week with Tom Hoagie. So uh, they keep keep on trucking through those runner-up finishes for me. But thank you very much for your five-star review, Eagles. That was um, first class. Thank you. Lovely and consistent your uh, second place finishes, Steve. Although I must say they're better yeah. than uh, complete implosions on a Sunday, which get you absolutely nothing. So, uh, uh, so mm. uh, well done with Hoagie. It was a, it was a, it was a good pick at what 125 to one. I think you picked him up at 125. Um, I think he was in the top. Um, I think he was in the top six or seven for total eagle season to date. And that's the way you could have actually. Um, you could have got Hudson Swafford. Mm. Um, I'm just bringing up my spreadsheet as we t- as we talk. Hudson Swafford season to date was 16th for total birdies, leading into the American Express. And I think he was something crazy like was it seven or eight straight cuts? Yeah, it made it. He'd won what was it? Twenty? Uh, I'm getting completely wrong. Now, 2017, 2018, something like that. He'd won the, yeah, won yeah. the event and yeah. back a, a few That's years right. ago. A um, couple of missed cuts in the event coming in, but uh, and at that price, you could take a chance. And uh, I've seen, yeah, seen a, a fair few big winning Twitter slips over the last day or two, which are, are very, very impressive. So well done if you managed to pluck Hudson Swafford out of the uh, 
out of the list last week at 250 to 1. He was available in a few spots on Monday, which is uh, a big old price. That average winning odds price for that tournament has taken another notch <laughs> northwards, isn't it? Unbelievable. I mean, if I was correct, seven um, the two leaders at 54 holes were 750 to 1 and 400 to 1 mm. by Paul Bajan and um, was it Lee Hodges? Yeah. No form whatsoever. Although I must say, Bajan and Hodges both come up regularly on my strokes going off the tee stats. They're good drivers of the ball. Um, the average winning price before this week was 138 to 1 going back to 2010. So that's now going to be what, pushing 150s? Yeah. And then you've got, you know, you've got people backing Patrick Cantley and John Rahm at, um, at nine to two, eleven to two, nine to one. It doesn't fit. Mm. <laughs> it just doesn't fit. Now, if you were backing John Rahm this week at eight to one, I get that. Cause, you know, it's his best course effectively. And it's a stretchy. Did you see him coming off one of the greens going, this is a, this is an effing <laughs> putting contest, a, a putting fest. Well, yeah, we could, we could have told you that, John, before you, before you arrived. That's, that's, that's what the American Express Bob Hoyt yeah, lottery is, isn't it? Yeah. He wasn't saying that the year he won it, though, was he? He was just a bit frustrated no. last week. So. Should we, should we talk about the, um, the Lowry and, um, oh, what have it, and, Sh- and Seamus Power double and how that was. The, I- the Irish goodbye. <laughs> What, what, ah, what did we do to upset the um, the Irish gods there, Barry? Too much, too much, too much weight of money on them. Look, I I think um, for Larry, it's his first event in, in, a, in a little while. So you know, like maybe the game's not fully sharp for the four rounds. Um, it happens, you know. What can you do? <laughs> Move on, go to the next tournament, see if he bounces back. Mm-hmm. Um, and Seamus has just been on this like Cinderella story of form and I'm not saying that you're going to like, uh, you know, there's always a chance he's going to have a poor round because it seems like he hasn't been having such a thing for months now. So like it's just, it's just part of the game. You know, you just sometimes on Sunday, you just don't wake up on the right side of the bed and it, it doesn't work out. Yeah. It doesn't happen. It's dis it's disappointing, especially when you had a you had a pre tournament um Irish transatlantic double on, didn't you, Paul? Well here here were my positions going into Sunday. Um I had Seamus Power as a, a single and a double with um with Shane Lowry. A single on Shane Lowry, of course. I had a single on Davis Riley, who's um, he was going reasonably well in the US. Um, a single, Top 12 or something, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, something like that. He was in with he was the hanging, He was hanging around, yeah. yeah. He was in the each way, each way fight, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, at, at the price, he was, you know, he was threatened in a place. I had an each way single on, um, Padre Harrington as well. So Harrington first, he was going really well, doubled the last. Had he birded the last, he'd have, he'd have been in a, a tie for sixth place, so he'd have got some uh, each way money back at 200 to one. So, so that one's gone. Um, Shane Lowry was favourite going into the final day. He triple bogeyed the first, shot five over, didn't even make the places. Seamus, I think, was second favourite going into the uh, into the final yeah, day. He was. And yeah. he doubled the first and then didn't even make the places. <laughs> Davis Riley triple bogeyed the first and didn't even make the places. <laughs> <laughs> so I, Sorry, Paul, <laughs> this is hilarious. I I, I had a <laughs> The, the Lowry Seamus double going into the final day. I backed it over a thousand to one, the double. Um, in the final day, I made it just under 14 to one for the double. Hudson Swafford was 20 to one to win his tournament. So it's more likely, uh, that the Lowry Seamus double was going to come in and Hudson Swafford wins that golf tournament. Yeah, I didn't even get the each way part of either the singles or the double and Swafford wins. Wow. Um, absolutely brutal Sunday. It's, it's not even as if you get, you're waiting a few holes for the, uh, for the kind of inevitable, um, you know, hole that just kills your week. It was all on the first. Triple, triple bogey, triple bogey, double bogey. <sighs> yes, not a good Sunday, but hopefully we bounce back us golf punters, don't we? Hopefully this week will be far, far, far better. I'm just looking at Shane here going back to the Northern Trust in August. That was the one that Tony T4 
Finau then became T2 Finau because he got into a playoff with Cam Smith. He was sixth going into the final round there, finished 11th. Uh, BMW at Wentworth, seventh going into the final round, finished 17th. Alfred Dunhill Links, second going into the final round, finished fourth. DP World Tour Championship, fifth, oh sorry, first at 36 holes, fifth at 54, finished ninth. And then your Abu Dhabi debacle, second going into Sunday, finished 12th. So he does seem to be, and I'm not saying that Shane Lowry is this, that and the other, I'm just pointing out facts. Shane Lowry at the moment isn't the best on Sundays. That will change because he's far too good a golfer. Um, and it's great that he's consistently knocking on the door. So a win is inbound, isn't it? It's coming. Just got to well, pick yeah. the right one. Given, given how he played on the Saturday, and you know, he, 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 he was hitting greens for fun, wasn't he, on Saturday? Bogey free, five under. Um, mm. Put himself right in the mix, right. The, in the condition, position. the conditions were right for him as yeah, well. Exactly. It was, it was tough. The wind and that—that that is Shane Lowry country, isn't it? Yeah, he started the final day on the winning score and shot five over. Yeah, Thomas Thomas Peters has got the victory. He's now charged into the world's top fifty, which, as we all know, it's a position he should have mm. been in for a period of time. The one course caught, I, I, I would assume now that he's going to come across to America. The one course we've got to look out for with Peters. I mean, Peters in the States on these tough major tracks. I can remember the season he played over there. It was just a conveyor belt of top finishes. So if he does go over to Riviera, he's going to be a danger because I think he finished second there the year that Dustin Johnson won. Yeah. So he's one to watch in the States, Peters. Yeah, you always, might you might find he's slightly underestimated, but yeah, he's one to watch in general, isn't he? It was that sixth yeah. win now, I think. Um, he's not even thirty yet. It's um, first Rolex Series win as well, and as you said, he vaulted right into the uh, you know around about thirtieth spot in the world rankings, so yeah. outside the top fifty. That was uh, a huge yeah. jump for the uh, for the number of points on offer last. So he's going to be at Augusta. That's yeah. that that card's now been stamped. Um, but yes, he's a he's a proper classical tough golf course player. So you know, watch out for him at Riviera Country Club. Watch out for him somewhere like a Quail Hollow. These these are the courses where Muirfield Village. These are the courses where Peters could be a real danger. Mm. When he, I, I would assume it's going to be limited starts because he's not a PGA to remember. He'll be getting in there on a top fifty exemption, won't he? Which I think would mean that he'd have to win to then be uh, accredited FedEx Cup points. Yeah. He's one of those Wills Alatoris black holes when it comes to rankings. Yeah. He'll certainly have a bit more freedom now, won't he? And as you say, WGCs and majors will be um, yeah. part of his schedule, which makes a huge difference. And uh, you, can, you can see him pushing on. That's two wins in the space of a few months now. And. Uh, We've always known he's a quality player. It's uh, it's just taken a little bit longer for him to get back into this kind of um, winning fold of uh, form. But he's there right now, one to watch, absolutely. So congratulations to Swafford backers and congratulations to Peter's um, backers last week. Paul is clearly, um, he could be phoning the Samaritans after the show, but um, I think Barry and I are slowly talking him round from jumping off his local... <laughs> Local bridge onto the M1, so just just stick with it, Paul. It's, Don't forget, of course. This is this is it's, the game. it's all about sensible gambling. Yeah, this is the game. We we know we know how to you kind of ride the lumps and thumps with this, don't you? And, uh, Paul, dust I yourself you down to, and come back and have another game. We need you to be gambler aware, Paul. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Right, I'm going to start this week with farmers insurance. Um, it's loaded. Well, to be fair, two fantastic tournaments this week. We've got lots to get through. Uh, Farmers Insurance Open. Now, first thing to say, and you're going to get tired of people saying this, it's a Wednesday start. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, last round on Saturday. They're clearing the decks before the NFL Championship Games on Sunday. Okay. I've never known that before. This is new to me, but clearly... Their rankings on a Sunday are absolutely abysmal when they go head to head with NFL championship games, which is what you would expect. Right. So you need to get your bets and you need to get your DraftKings lineups all sorted out over here in the UK by Wednesday morning at the latest. 
Right, two courses this week. We all know about Torrey Pines South Course, where they hosted the 2021 US Open. It's a beast. 7,800 yards or there or thereabouts. Par 72, classical golf course, coastal. Um, features Kikuyu Grass Rough and Poana Greens. So you won't be finding Webb Simpson in the field this week. There's one crack be that on Wednesday or Thursday. 18 holes will be on the north course as well before the cut. That is a Tom Weiskopf redesign. Um, it's a lot shorter, 7,258 yards. There is no water in play on the golf course. Again, it is Kikuyu, uh, Kikuyu grass rough. The greens are slightly bigger at 6,000 square feet and they feature pure bent grass. That is where you must get your score. I think every winner here, I mean, Patrick Reed 12 months ago shot 64 there on his crack at the North Course. Uh, yeah, he shot 64. He then shot par on the Friday on the South Course. Uh, the year before that, 68 was the score. Uh, that Mark Leishman got on the north course. He then backed that up with a 72 on the south and going back to Justin Rose, and they were really easy scoring conditions this particular year. He came off pretty much nothing at all at the PGA West event the week before in the desert. He turned up here and shot 63 on the north course, so nine under par. Back that up with a 68 in round two. Got to go low on the on the north and that makes logical sense because, let's be frank, I mean, last year the South Course averaged across the, all 72 holes across the whole field at 73.34. So it was 1.34 over par. It ranked fourth most difficult of 51 courses last year. So it actually ranked tougher than a number of the major championships. This is proper golf this week. This, to me, is always where the real season starts. Yeah, you know, there, there won't be any of this 28 under par and all this rubbish this week. It's a genuine test, a genuine golf course. And the cream does tend to come to the top. Patrick Reed, 14 under last year. He actually won by four, I think it was. Or was it five? It was four or five shots he won by. Yeah, it was clear, wasn't it? Um, there was that Ferrari on Saturday, wasn't there? And the whole, me you know, the golf media and Twitter turned on him. He actually won by five from Tony Fina. He was just an absolute. It was a Patrick. It was typically Patrick Reed, from wedge in, from iron in. He was absolutely fantastic in terms of his short game and his scrambling was off the off the charts. And that is the thing here: you can win it one of two ways. You can be a short game wizard, or you can be a metronomic ball striker. And it's a yeah, you know, it's actually a typical classical golf course test, isn't it? Any kind of shape can win this. Leishman. Similar kind of way that he won in 2020 at 15 under. Could not hit a fairway for love nor money. Constantly in the Kikuyu grass rough. But from there on in, especially the chipping and the putting was absolutely phenomenal. He, he held off John Rahm by a shot. Then we go back to Justin Rose, 21 under par in 2019. Jason Day, the second of his wins, 9 under par when it was tough. John Rahm, this was his first ever PGA Tour victory. He was the first player going back into the 50s that won this on tournament debut. 2017, 13 under par, John Rahm. So there, that, that that is a definite precedent. You want players here that at least have had a go around here in the main. And then we've got Brand Schnedeker. And he won, of course, six under par when it was blowing some of the worst golf conditions I've ever witnessed. It was it kind of 45, 50 mile an hour winds on the, was on that, the Sunday? Was that the one that went to, um, went over to the Monday? There was one, wasn't there, I think? It's, well, he managed to get round, didn't he? I think he started the final round in 40 something place. Uh, he started in 27th place. He made the cut on the number 57th. Got to 27th and then he shot the round of the gods in the most unbelievable conditions. 
shot under par, three under par or something, and everyone else uh, was being blown off the course. They stopped the event, had a, had a Monday morning finish for the last, what, eight, ten groups? Yeah, yeah. And no one could get near his score. Yeah. I had Jimmy Walker that week, you'd be surprised, who was actually leading going into the final round. Yeah, I remember it. it was, uh, <laughs> you kind of look at the position and you're thinking, I just would much rather you were sitting there in the hutch at the moment than... Uh, Oh, good, out yeah. on the course. And that's the thing with this tournament. It can be a bit like that. What I'm reporting this week is beautiful conditions. Barely a breath of wind across Wednesday through Saturday. I think Friday looks a little bit peaky, but it's it's literally nothing. I'm using Windfinder as I always do. Right now, I'm seeing nothing more than um, about 11, 12 mile an hour gust on Friday, which would be round three. The rest of it, it's all... Calm weather, beautiful, um, either you've got a marine layer by the looks of it on Wednesday, um, Thursday, beautiful sunshine, um, there's going to be cloud and sunshine across Friday and Saturday, and the temperatures are going to be very, I put this in the, pro, in the uh, preview, they feel Northern European to me, they're going to be that kind of 18 to, to, to 20 degrees Celsius, mm. so yeah, nice golfing conditions. I think I think there hasn't been too much rain in the immediate build-up. I think there's going to be some run on the fairways. Um, it's January. How how firm can you really get these Poana greens, and how firm do they really want to get them anyway? Um, I expect it's going to be potentially 16, 17 under. That's my gut feel. Yeah, if the conditions kind of, are a, a, a mid, it's, it's going to be the typical mid-score kind of finish. Yeah. Right? Doesn't doesn't sniff of being overly brutal, does it? Compared to some of the years, so, so if you can make a score on the north um, and uh, the score's there to be made, as you've just described, then uh, and yeah, you can get yourself into a, a kind of a mid-teens position by the end of the four rounds, give or take. Do you do you look forward to this tournament, Baron? I like what you said earlier. This feels like the real start to the season or start to the year, the calendar year of golf um, on the PJ Tour. So, yeah, I, I do. Um, this this one starts to kind of raise my eyebrows a bit and get me more interested. Um, hopefully, hopefully this is the, a sign of change as well in my ability to pick people that actually do well in tournaments. <laughs> I, I seem to be I seem to be slightly out of synchronization with uh, with what's going on uh, to to put it mildly. So um, yeah, let's see what happens. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, it'll be interesting to see Ram back again on on. Um, I, I don't know. I feel, I feel, you know, the way Ram can kind of, I, I don't know, not to jump into picks, but I feel like this could be, um, he, he could be bullying ahead this week based on last week, you know, gets to a course that he was, it, it's different to what he was bitching about last week. Um, the pudding contest only. So I'm interested to see. Yeah. Uh, what you, you personally, you'd never back John Rahm at the American Express. That is just a mad, that's a mad bet. At the same kind of price, you'd back him here on his favourite golf course at a proper test, wouldn't you? I mean, you just got to look at his results around here, reigning US Open champion. He absolutely obliterates the field around here and he obliterates the field around Muirfield Village. I mean, look at what he did last year at Muirfield. He was six shots ahead. Then he had the COVID situation. These are his kind of golf courses. So this is, this yeah. is where you have if you're going to go for that single-digit bet on John Rahm, it's here. It's certainly not not last week. That that's just craziness. Um, no, last week last week was too. It's there's too many too guys volatile, have a chance. Clearly. There's too many guys have a chance to to Absolutely. compete on a course that is on a sorry on a setup yeah. uh, or a tournament setup that is that e- easy. Let's say it was you know. So yeah. <clears throat> it opens up the field. So if you're there at the start of the week trying to put lines through guys. It, there's a lot less lines you can um, write last week versus this week. You can strike off a lot more people and kind of uh, shorten the, the list down for who to make your picks from. I'm not going to take you through any tournament statistics because whatever I look at in terms of traditional statistics or strokes gain stats, as I said at the top, it's so volatile around here. You can have a putter and scramble like Patrick Reed winning or you can have a ball strike like John Rahm winning. Anything in between, it's more than possible. 
I used to have also this belief that this was a pure bombers golf course. After seeing Patrick Reed win around here last year, and Mark Leishman isn't exactly, I mean, he gets it out there, but he's kind of middle of the pack. To me, it's just people that can play well on your traditional stretching golf courses. That's who we're looking for. Now, the, the advantage we do have at Golf Betting System are our strokes gained statistics. And I just thought I'd bring this to light, actually. Um, some of you listeners might not have come and, and uh, used them at Golf Betting System, but we provide it all free of charge. It's all fully sortable on any device. Now, this is the strokes gained total numbers going back, Paul. Would this be 2016 at Torrey Pines? It is, yes. Yes, Okay. I'm now listing through the top 10 strokes gained total since 2016 on the South Course, okay, at the Farmers Insurance Open. I'm only including people that have got multiple rounds, okay, because if you look at the stats, there's three at the top that have only played a single round and then missed the cut, right. 10, I've got 12 rounds, Ryan Palmer. Oh, sorry, it's, it's, I'm doing the top eight here. So Ryan Palmer is eighth, 12 rounds. Uh, Gary Woodland at 7, he's played 16. Patrick Reed at 6, he's played 13 rounds. Then we've got top 5. Mark Leishman is in the top 5, he's played 16 rounds around here. John Rahm at 4, played 15. Top 3, 11 rounds played. Justin Rose is 3. Tony Finau is 2. He's played 18 rounds around here and ranked second in the field for strokes gained total going back to 2016. That just shows you how much Tony Finau loves this place. Number one, he's only played four rounds. He missed the cut and then he got a top 10 last year. Will Zala Torres. So those are the, those are genuine strokes gained total stats on this golf course going mm. back to 2016. So, and, tell Torres. I'm, I'm, well, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna shortcut everything here. I'm just gonna tell you, I have tipped up Zalatoris, I've tipped up Tony Finau, and I've tipped up Mark Leishman. And it wasn't solely from those stats, because I'll be honest with you, I didn't really look at those stats until pre-pot this morning. But that's just, that completely backed up all of my research, my gut feel, watching this year in, year out. Those three players fit this course perfectly. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of it is just about that, uh, at fitting the style of course, fitting the style of play required, fitting the um, the difficulty. And it's interesting if you look at Zalatoris across a number of difficult, um, more stretching tracks, and uh, he really is starting to kind of show his hand in that respect. And um, it's no surprise to see him playing well in some of the major championships as well, because that kind of fits into the uh, to the narrative that's starting to form with him. So, um, mm. so yeah, I can I can see see the logic very much so with Zalatoris as well. On a tough track. I went eight places each way with Ladbrokes on Tony Finau. I took 28 to 1. Um, I was surprised he was chalked up. Unibet had him up first show at 33 to 1. Six places. I mean, 33 to 1 on Tony Finau around here is a cracking price. Bear in mind, I managed to get 30 on him for the US Open, and I was raving about it last year. Mm. And I had to take an anti post bet for that. So Tony Fina was 33s. I took the eight places, 28 to 1, because we know Tony does like a T4. But, you know, he's a winner now. He won the Northern Trust. This is a perfect golf course for him. And you've got to say one thing about Tony. If you look at this stretch now, Torrey Pines, uh, I believe they're playing Pebble next week, which I doubt he'll play. But then you've got another two courses he absolutely loves. You've got uh, Scottsdale for the Waste Management, Phoenix Open. And then you've got Riviera Country Club. Again, Kikuyu, Grass, Rough. And those Ben mixed with Poana Greens. I mean, this, this is this is Tony Finau country. Interestingly enough, his one and only Corn Ferry Tour win was at the Stone Bray Classic, which again is in Haywood, uh, Haywood uh, California. So he just loves the Golden State. So I'm in on Zalatoris at 28. Um, that price, there's there's no 30s now. It's all gone. He was genuinely 30s and 33s with the play, with the companies not offering extended places. So I'm happy with that bet. I think Zalatoris is perfect for this place. John Rahm, as we said earlier, the only player to win his first ever PGO Tour event at this Farmers Insurance Open. I could see Zalatoris in exactly the same mould. Bear in mind, this guy was contending to win the US Open. Yeah, and he's you know he was that he he hadn't even had a run on the PGA Tour at that point. 
He just comes straight off the corn ferry. I mean, what's that tell you about Will Zalatoris? Mm. I picked him um, Sunday. I wrote the tip up on Sunday based on the fact that he shot that crazy 11 under 61 on the tournament course on Friday. And let's be frank, Will Zalatoris is, um, his weakness is his putting. So if he's shooting 61, the putter can't be that bulky. Yeah. I also felt a bit for Zalatoris last year towards the end of the season. He, he was having, you know, he didn't have any status to be in the FedEx Cup playoffs. That was damaged. Well, that was basically making him making any Ryder Cup spot impossible. He didn't know what to do. His, his management team didn't know where to take him. There was talk of him coming to Europe, but what was the point of that? And his, and his whole year just kind of came to a grinding halt because the rule book meant that he couldn't really take advantage of the FedEx Cup playoffs. I think he hits 2022 fresh, clearly popped in with the top uh, top six finish last week, and that isn't Zalatoris' game, shooting 25 under around a, a desert golf course, to me. I think this is right up his street, I really do. So I'm quite excited about Zalatoris. I, I, and he was tenth. He was in the top ten here last year on on tournament debut. That just shows you everything you need to know about the guy. Three top eight major finishes, plus a further top eight finish at the WGC at St Jude last year, in a very short space of time. I think this is more of his bread and butter. Mark Leishman. Uh, so I got Zalatoris at twenty eight to one again with uh, eight with Labrooks eight the full eight places each way on those prices. Um, I'm just looking at Zalatoris now. There is a 33 to 1 hanging out there with Bet365 on the industry standard five places each way. I caught the odds to place. Um, there's also a 30 to 1 out there with Bet Fred. Eight places each way on, on that. Um, I've got Mark Leishman at 40 to 1, one and a half points each way. I mean, that doesn't really need any explanation. The champion here two years ago. Uh, we know just looking at Jason Day. South Africans and Australians go well around here because of the Kikuyu grass. They tend to be good putters. And they're not afraid of Poana greens. And Leishman's the sort that you put up at the Sony Open at 22 to 1. He doesn't do a lot for you. You leave him out of your tips. He then goes to a track that he loves and he wins. Leishman's done well at Riviera Country Club as well. He, yeah, he... I've always said this. I think Leishman's the sort that could win a major at a large price. So, you know, this is right up his street for me. I've got Leishman, Zalatoris and Fino at 28 and then 40 to 1. Um, any one, any players at the top of the board that you guys are interested in before we move to the bigger prices? Um I'll keep my powder dry on that because I've got one that I've got in some doubles, but that will kind of okay. be a spoiler on my preview. Yeah. So I'll do that after. But so no, the other one I've got is a bit further down. So unless Barry's got anything at the uh, top end, <laughs> yeah, not really. Um, I'm interested to see how Hideki goes this week because yeah. you know we've been saying over the last couple of weeks when Hideki gets really hot, he can just rip off a few wins yeah. in a short space of time. He's he's got past and previous for that. So. Uh, and this is the kind of place that you could see him just uh, pummeling again. Agree. Um, I'm seeing 20, a lot of 20, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing a lot of Twitter chat out there about Bryson DeChambeau and Dustin Johnson. I've got no interest in either of those. Matt Suama's the sort. He's the fly in the ointment this week, in my opinion. Matt Suama. Twenty to yeah. one. I was amazed. That's the same price that he won the Sony at. Yeah. That's that's what's kind of got me like my eyebrow raised. Gone. How, how is he still twenty to one? Like he's won two of his last three events that he's played. And listeners um, will be shouting down the, the the phone at us or whatever their device is. Oh yeah, but it's a much tougher field. But even so, he how is Xander Schauffele shorter than Hideki Matsuyama, who's won two of his last three starts? I don't get that. Yeah. Don't get it. Yeah, it's it's um, the bookies are. Terrified of Xander for some reason. Mm. Yeah, always have. Uh, yeah. That's just a yeah. crazy price, isn't it? I love Xander, but you, he should not be shorter than Hideki Matsuama this week. Who, like you said, we know with Hideki, we've got previous. When he gets on it, he just he can string wins together. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Barry. That Matsuama price, oh, that seriously got my attention. The one thing yeah, I will my, say, the only my, reason I didn't go with Matsuama was. 
And again, Steve, with his trends, there has n- nobody got, and I went all the way back to like 2005, no one has won a tournament prior to winning this in the calendar year. So I didn't take him on that basis. But I can, I think Matsu Arm at 20 is a, is a real fly in the ointment this week. Why wouldn't he be? Yeah, I might have to do it. That's yeah, breaking my own rules. We've got you know, in, in, or break my own likes in terms of backing shorter prices. Um, but yeah, that just seems like a mismatch for me. The way the top of the market set. It's not that mm-hmm. short, but right. is it? At the end of the day, it's twenty to one. No, it's not. Twenty, 20, 20 to one's to lovely. Minute. Yeah, I mean, yeah, sorry, tw- twenty to one versus yeah, exactly. So, but you know, who are you going to take this week? Who are you going to put your money on uh, Hideki at twenty to one or DJ at twenty to one? Oh, it's not DJ even a conversation. DJ. D- DJ is using this just to get up to speed for Saudi next week. It's, it's obvious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. He, he can't stand the golf course. He, when was the last time DJ played uh, a tournament? What, three and a half months ago? <laughs> yeah, it's a long, 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 long way back, isn't it? That's, uh, it's hard mm. to get into top gear after that length of time off. Mm. If, they're, if they're hanging 20 to 1 on Dustin Johnson arriving at Riviera in a few weeks' time and he's and he's played half reasonably well at either one yeah. here or Saudi, I'm all over him like a rash at Riviera. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not coming off a three and a half month layup. That's just rubbish, in my opinion. That's a bad bet. So he could be my layup. Watch, layer, watch, could watch, be my, watch could him be win. Layer, layer <laughs> week, Dustin yeah. Johnson. Yeah. <laughs> Quickly back, Deja. It's please let's not do like a fade of the week or lay of the week because I I, I will one hundred percent get it right uh, because that's how that's how <laughs> that's how off I am at the moment or how off I feel with uh, with my picks but yeah that that was my thoughts on the top of the market um I th- think I'm thinking a bit further down I'm looking at uh, Max Homa. Mm-hmm. Um, like so the Paul, courses yeah that, that like, that's so. gonna be Paul's tip he was telling me this last Thursday so yes. <laughs> I can't. I can't argue with any of the logic. Well, well Paul, you, I, w- I won't steal your thunder. You please, please go in and give uh, some real rationale to this, rather than just uh, me loving Max and yeah. uh, hi- hi- him loving California and playing yeah. pretty well at the moment. Well, no, no, they're, they're all part of the mix, Barry. And um, you're right. Max Homer is the only one I've backed at, uh, outside of my double, and um, I thought seventy to one is well worth taking on. Three wins now, isn't he? Uh, Quail mm. Hollow won at, um, he won the Genesis at Riviera, which again, in terms of the wow. Poana Greens. Mm. Um, 1481 in September as well, so he's in some decent nick. Um, Don't forget, that's, that's a mix of Bent and Poe as well on yeah, those exactly, greens. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Of uh, course, uh, uh, listeners will remember that. I got another second place at that tournament with Maverick McNeely. Yeah. 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 I, I think what, what Max is showing is that he's one of these players who can, Get over the line, he can win an event. Yeah. Two two wins in twenty twenty one, and uh, you know there's miscuts in there, and uh, I get that. But you know his ceiling's higher than that. He's he's out there, and he's he's a player who can get over the line and can uh, can win at a price for you. He's uh, not, knocked the rust off at the tournament, the Champions fifteenth, ninth, uh, and eighteenth here from his last two attempts. So some mm. reasonably good incoming form in terms of course form as well. So. So yeah, as an each way bet, I thought Max Homer was well worth yeah. the uh, the odds at seventies. Absolutely, I think Homer's a cracking bet this week. I really do. I didn't go with him, but um, yeah, I, I get your logic. The one I went with was Frankie Molinari. Mm. Yeah, he showed a bit last week, didn't he? If you look at the last few renewals here, Tom Hoagie did exactly the same. Um, Hoagie played brilliant. I, we were on him. Uh, a 200 to 1 I think at the Amex in 2020 he then came here and topped top 8 for a nice each way payout um, last year I'm trying to think the player that did it he did exactly the same last year there was a player that was really strong from tee to green the week before oh it was Hedrick Norlander 150 to 1 he landed um, I think he was tied second or tied third behind Fina 150 to 1 you just look at the way Frankie played last week, and he he had a I wouldn't say he had a, a tiny little sniff of victory there as well coming towards the end. I just I just think with Molinari and his history and the fact that you know he's won at Bay Hill, a long classical golf course. We know that he came very close to winning the Masters. 
Um, there's a lot of course correlation between where Francesco Molinari, who can be a, clearly an elite major winner, um, plays well. So yeah, I, I just took him. Now that I've got a beef here. I took Betfred. Was it what price did I get, Paul? Seventy to one. Uh, Eighty, I think. Eighty to one. Yeah. Eighty to one with Betfred. Uh, seven places each way, fifty odds, and then within half an hour, they'd extended their each way places to eight places each way, and I don't think they um, they cut his price either at first. And we're seeing this more and more now, and I think it's becoming a problem with golf punting, especially on a Monday. Bookmakers, online bookmakers, are deliberately keeping the amount of each way places down, and then they switch them up later on the day, or even with Treble H Sport, they tend to switch them up to eight places each way on a Tuesday mid a Tuesday mid morning. I just think that's disingen- disingenuous. I really do. If you're going to put a market up there. You know, fair play to Skybet, fair play to Paddy Power, Bet Fair Sports, but fair play to Boyle Sports even. They go 10 places each way, Boyle Sports, and that's it. They're not changing. Unibet, they only offer six places, but again, they do the same. They put their market out there. They put their prices out there. Better way, chaps. It's a level playing field from when we open the market to when the market closes. You're getting more and more of these bookmakers now. They're constantly changing their each way offering, trying to reduce the amount of savvy value hunting punters on a Monday. That's just wrong. It's not good. I, I also say La, uh, Coral and Ladbrokes, again, eight places each way on both events this week, and those terms will not change as soon as they open that market. Yeah. That's the way, they, you know, they're actually bookmakers. They're, they're offering a bookmaking service. These guys that are constantly switching throughout the day on their each way terms is disingenuous. And as you said to me, Paul, and we said this on, it must cause so many customer service issues. Yeah. It must be unbelievable. Well, it is. I, from your perspective, you know, you, you've, you've placed your bet at seven places each way. And yeah. you take a look half an hour later and it's eight. So what do you think? Yeah, do you, I, said, do you... I went to pick up my son from the child mine, just got back to my desk, looked at, oh, it's eight places all of a sudden. Yeah. It's the same price. So, so how many people then go straight onto the live chat? I want to cancel that original bet and uh, I want to re-establish it at the new price. No, you can't do that. Or, yes, you can do that. I mean, whether some of these bookies will actually make an exception if you're a good customer, who knows? Um, but ultimately, okay. it causes a problem. You know, you're, you, you're unhappy with it. Um, also, you know, the alternative is you get to the end of the um, tournament and you've seen that these places are offering more, more places uh, than you potentially got, and you're unsure yourself as to whether you got six or seven or eight places, you know. And, uh, yeah. and, you, and, and this is the point, Paul. You you know exactly what will happen when when Francesco finishes sole eighth place on <laughs> on Saturday, or in a two way tie for seventh on Saturday. Yeah, yeah. I'll be absolutely raging. Yeah. Because if I'd have left my bet 20 minutes, which would have meant that I had to leave my publishing another 20 minutes for people to actually go through this stuff, yeah, I'd have actually got the eight places each way. Yeah. It's just ridiculous. Ridiculous. Yeah. And I, the, the problem is you're trying to second guess what the moves are going to be. And I, I can see why they're doing it. I can see that they're trying to, um, you know, kind of mitigate their, um, position against the sharper, punters who are trying to get that early value with the players price um, in combination with um, with the each way extended places so by offering less places and understanding where the the, the, the kind of the bookie or, or the, the the punter direction is going to be for that way the bookies can adjust but it doesn't take away the frustration and ultimately yeah it's um, it, it's a customer service issue it's a customer service issue that results in um, further issues down the line and everything's a bit disjointed. So <sighs> frustrating, Steve. And, you know, from your perspective, frustrating. And it's not just one bookie that's doing it. There's a few of them um, that are changing their positions during the course of the first day or two. Um, or- Will- William Hill, Paddy, uh, William Hill, Treble H Sport and Betfred. They're the three. All of the others are opening up their market, each way terms, and they never change. So, yeah, we'll, we'll keep we a close did, eye on that moving forward because it's not right. It's, it's not good at all. 
what do you do then? Do you just protest by not betting with them or do they just suck you back in one week where you see that right combo of price and uh, places and you just go, oh, to hell with it and you just back well, it? Well, I know for a fact they won't do it for the four majors. They'll all set their stalls out and that, that'll that be that. There won't be, as soon as the anti-post gets switched off and they go to their full markets, the, you won't see any of those. It's just traditional week in, week out punters that are getting punished by it. Majors, they'll just set their stall out, they'll take the bets. I just don't think it's right. If, How, um, if the, all, all, all we can do is just keep mentioning it. You know, it's just it's just not right. So, you know, mm. it, it it makes a mockery of of having of of trying to get on a as Paul said a best the best odds with the best each way turns because they're constantly changing with those three firms. No, it's happened to me before and I've been fuming and to the point where I know I'm kind of caught in that limbo where they're not going to refund the original bet and give me and, and let me bet back on, well, sorry, they're always going to take the bet, but uh, back the new price places combo. So out of utter FOMO, I've gone and placed another bet at the ex- with the extended places just to avoid the Sunday night fear. It was almost like, ins- you know, uh, emotional insurance just to have that eventuality covered off but of course we know, we know how golf betting it. works <laughs> oh stop like i mean i'd almost want to back uh frankie with the extended places for you just to on boil sports to 10 <laughs> just to cover it i was close actually um, he was 66 is on ball sports with a full 10 and i could see oh, him finishing tied eight tied ninth, something like that so, and you yeah, back to what seventies or it was it eighties? As was was this eighties was seven? Yeah, yeah, and all yeah, of the other extended okay. firm, all of the other extended firms, like uh, they were offering um, like sixty sixes on him. So when yeah, it came the, out, the, you know, the eighties is yeah, yeah, yeah it's I get too it. big a gap not to take the seven places. So yeah, I'll take this, and then all of a sudden, oh no, no, it's eight places. And as ever, you know, we don't we don't cheat. The, uh, the readers and the listeners at Golf Betting System, we, we put the terms up as where they go to press. So, and yeah, that's just, just, that's just the golf betting experience. Right. Let's move on then. So any other players that you two fancy over and above I mean, Max Luke, Home and Barry, who, who do you fancy further down? I, on the Frankie shout, uh, it's great to see him showing a bit of form again. I mean, it was, um, it was a wonderful, uh, streak of form he had when he went up you know all the way up to winning the uh, open championship and um it's nice to see him back you know the uh he kind of felt um it was that that moment at augusta on 12 you know he just hasn't quite been right since then so hopefully he's starting no. to get over that and we'll see him back up there again because it's he's, a thing of beauty when thing of beauty when he's striking the ball so well just hitting it he is 181st in the world rankings right now and that's after a top six finish last week. So he must have been well over two hundred. I mean, that isn't Francesco Molinari, is it? He's a top, you know, what, a top twenty player in the world. Yeah, at his best, yeah, yeah, at his best, yeah. Mm. I think you're getting value at that price. Who else for you, Barry? Anyone? No, nobody's screaming at me yet. You'll you'll tweet out some selections if you place them, yeah. Oh, I don't know. Like, I mean, pu- publishing myself for uh, public ridicule, it's, just, <laughs> it's not, we, not we my idea of enjoyment. Here, so, uh... <laughs> if I have any epiphanies, I will, yeah. But, I thought um... you might be over a Cam Davis or one of these guys that, um, that ticks all the boxes for driving the ball a long way. I need I need to look back at a couple of the bets in the last couple of weeks have disappointed me and see if there's any value in um, grabbing them this time around. Maybe I just mistimed them. So I need to figure out what's going wrong. Right, let's move forward then. Let's move forward to your event. And I, I am going to say the sponsor, Paul. I, I've been trying to avoid saying the sponsor, but I need to really. The Slime NC.io Dubai Desert Classic. <laughs> Slink, Slinkio Dubai Desert Classic. I don't, I don't, I don't know. know. Is it well, Slink dot io Dubai Desert Classic? Well, listen, I, I'm going to call it the Slink dot io, but you've you've now got me thinking as to whether I'm, I'm completely off the uh, off the scent on this one. Um, I'm assuming that dot io is to do with the the TLD on the domain. So a Slink dot io is yes. Let's go with that. Yeah. Dubai Desert let's go Classic. Slink. Paul, let's talk Slink.io Dubai Desert Classic. Yeah, they're a logistics software provider, apparently, if you're remotely interested. But they're a fresh sponsor for the Dubai Desert Classic this week. 
Um, anyway, it's a Rolex Series event again, so we've got two on the trot. Eight million dollar prize fund, eight thousand of the uh, new DP World Tour ranking points up for grabs this week. So it's meant that a number of the big names that we had last week have stuck around for a second week, which doesn't always happen in these uh, Middle East swings at the start of the season. Um, we're also the likes of Sergio Garcia and uh, Paul Casey added to the field over and above last week. So we've got, um, if anything, an, an even stronger field than we had last week in Abu Dhabi and certainly the strongest Dubai Desert Classic that I can remember for many, many a year. Uh, quick look at the field then, uh, or quick look at the market rather. Rory McIlroy is the 15 to 2 favourite. Victor Hovland's 9 to 1. Colin Morikawa, 11 to 1. Till Hatton's 18s. The aforementioned Sergio Garcia, 22 to 1. Shane Lowry, 25 to 1. Uh, last week's winner, Thomas Peters, 25s also. Adam Scott, he showed a bit of form last week, 28. Defending champion Paul Casey, same price, 28 to 1. Tommy Fleet with 30s, Bernd Wiesberger 33 to 1, 40 to 1 bar that list of 10 or so players that I've just read through. Lots of extended each way places on offer right now. Boyles, Labrooks, Coral, Betfair, Paddy, Power, Will, William Hill. All of them eight places each way, 150 odds as I speak right now at uh, around about 9 o'clock Tuesday morning over here in the UK. Uh, the Dubai Desert Classic, once again, it's being played at the Majlis Course at Emirates Golf Club in Dubai. It's a familiar course. We've seen it for many a year now on the tour. It's been extended of late. There's three of the holes which I've listed in my preview have been extended a little over last, or well, the last couple of seasons. It's now 7,424 yard par 72. So it's eking up in length. I can remember when it was kind of a 7-2 and it's, uh, I'd have classed it as a kind of a, a, a mid-length par 72, but it's getting a little bit longer now so uh, um, it's naturally it's been extended to to cater against the, uh, the modern golfer I guess. A typical desert affair though, exposed fairways, Bermuda Tiff Eagle Greens, speedy 12, 12 and a half usually on the stimp. Um, bit of a lopsided course, the back nine is longer but it tends to be where the scoring holes come into the equation far more. There's a short par four on the back nine. There's three reachable par fives if you get your drives away on the, on the back nine as well. So you can really can make a score on the back nine here at the Emirates. A quick look at some previous winners. Let's go back to 2010. Miguel Angel Jimenez won at 66 to one in 2010. Alvaro Quiros 16 to one. A Spanish treble with Rafa Cabrera Bayo winning in 2012 at 125 to 1. Uh, Steve Gallagher won in 2013 and 2014 at 70 to 1 and 45 to 1 respectively. Rory McIlroy won at 7 to 2 in 2015 having previously won in 2009 also. Danny Willett 40 to 1. Sergio Garcia 20 to 1 with the next two. Hao Tong Lee won in 2018 at 110 to 1. Bryson won in 2019 at 10s. Lucas Herbert was a 200 to 1 shot in 2020. And then Paul Casey came over from the Amex last year, um, having finished 8th at the Amex, mopped up here at 25 to 1. 12 months ago. The weather's set pretty fair this year. Um, calm on Thursday. Should be really scorable on Thursday. We may get 15, maybe 20 miles an hour uh, winds at times uh, on Friday through Sunday. It looks like a steady wind though. It doesn't look so gusty and that's kind of more as to what you should expect around here. This doesn't tend to be a flat calm course. It really is quite exposed and you usually do get a bit of wind particularly in the afternoon. So and um, 15 miles an hour isn't to, you know, anything, um, extraordinary here, particularly if it's steady rather than, um, blowing 10 and then gusting up to 30, which doesn't look to be the order of the day. So, um, I still think we're going to see some scores, um, made around here. I mean, you, you can, when the conditions are really good, you can make a, a really deep score. Bryson was 24 under, um, back in 2019, for instance. Lucas Herbert, nine under when he won couple of years ago so if the conditions really are tricky then um, it can make a pretty significant impact to the uh, to the winning score Paul Casey last year 17 under I think maybe 19 20 might be the number this year give or take a shot or two and that kind of feels where we where we are coming into this week 
Um, it's not going to be flat calm, but it's not going to be, it's not going to be Abu Dhabi like in terms of um, difficulty um, and wind gusts, which will impact uh, scoring. Um, we've got lots of historical stats as loads listed, listed on my preview this week. If you look back through, and if you go back to pre the strokes gained days, greens and regulation was always a really good pointer for this. Um, and also having had or having experienced a strong greens and regulation week prior to winning here at the Emirates was also um, a very, really good indicator. So you used to be able to go through the stats and say, well, who's played well? Who's, who's had a good greens and regulation performance around here at the Emirates in the past? And uh, kind of start to form your, your um, shortlist that way. And I still wouldn't put punters off doing that, even though we've got um, all of the strokes game data, of course, nowadays. Um, looking at strokes gained, though, and um, as Steve alluded to right at the start, we've now published um, the last three years' worth of strokes gained data for the Dubai Desert Classic on the website, aggregated, so you can see who historically cool. has played well. Let me um, run through the top. Let me run yeah, through the top top six for the listeners. But I do urge you come to Gold Bank System. Support the website. It's all free. It's all fully sortable. So T to green, strokes game, ball striking, who's the best putter? It's all available here. Uh, top six, Sergio is at six. Tio Bjorn Olsen at five. Lucas Herbert, who won here. Well, clearly Garcia did as well. Herbert, a winner. In, uh, he, he's fourth. Laurie Cantor at three. Robert McIntyre at two. And Paul Casey at one. There you um, go. Yeah, so... As it is with the strokes gain stuff on the DP World Tour, um, we've only got three years worth of data. So as we continue to collect this over the next year or two, it will start to grow in mm-hmm. um, growing its complexity, but also growing its uh, kind of gravitas, I suppose. Um, the thing to point out with um, strokes gain, if you look at the winners, so Bryson, Herbert, Casey from the last three, there really is some strong correlation. And this kind of ties into greens in regulation to a degree. Um Fourth for strokes gained off the tee for Bryson. Ninth for strokes gained off the tee for Herbert. Sixth for the same stat for Paul Casey on their way to winning. So sixth, ninth, and so sixth, ninth, and fourth. Strokes gained tee to green. Bryson was third. Herbert was seventh. Casey was first. So it was all about off the tee. It was all about strokes gained tee to green for the wins from those three players over the last three years. So if you're combining, Mm -hmm. looking at players who are strong in both those aspects, uh, both historically and also coming into this event, and to those who've potentially got a good historical greens and regulation performance here, you probably aren't going to be far off the mark um, unless unless every trend gets blown smithereens this week. Um, Going back to 2010, each of the winners had a top 10 finish in one of their last nine starts. So if you're looking for players with good incoming current form, that's not a bad start either, really. Um, Current form pretty is a good pointer. And the only players that really start to become difficult when you look at that kind of number, Lucas Herbert, whose top 10 was reasonably distant, but a lot of the others um, you could pick out as... uh, as having had a decent uh, a decent spin in the recent weeks. And in terms of course form, that's another good pointer. And again, going back to 2010, the only player who didn't have a top 20 here at the Emirates in their um, in their recent history was Hao Tong Lee. And the rest of them all had a top 20 finish. And that kind of spills into debutants as well. I mean, you may get a place out of a debutant. You mentioned Laurie Cantor just a minute ago. He, uh, mm-hmm. I think he finished fourth from debut last year. Um, but they tend to be the exception rather than the rule. You get a lot of players who've played a lot of events, or at least one event here, who then go on to win, rather than players that are seeing this course for the first time. So I think you can boil it all down. It's one of those events where you could probably put a number of factors into a mix and, and come back with a reasonably good shortlist and based on all of the known factors and, uh, and just hope they don't get blown out of the water. So a good long game, bit of experience, and you know, a recent enough top, top 10 performance. And playing well, scoring well on Bermuda grass greens, Tiff Eagle greens. We see quite a few Tiff Eagle greens dotted around the... Uh, the DP World Tour schedule. So players who get on with that kind of surface, uh, again, you're going to need to make some putts this week. You're going to need to get to that kind of 20 under number to, to win. So uh, 
Um, I don't think there's any room for being a particularly poor putter um, on the week. But um, yeah, lo- lots to add into the mix. Um, boiling it all down, I've backed five in total together. And um, I don't know. I, just, I started at the top and I really did struggle to get rid of Rory McIlroy. And pretty much every angle that I've uh, looked at this week has led me back to McIlroy. Um, I kind of said at the start of the year, I'm going to embrace what the stats are telling me. The stats are telling me Rory wins this. Um, I've backed Rory to win this. He's the favourite, 15 to 2. Um, I don't tend to go towards the top end of the market like that, but um, I'm struggling to see past him. So put my money where my mouth is and I'll back him. I've, I've, I've backed him 15 to 2, win only, 5 points. If you look at the numbers, look, look at his history here. Two wins from 11 starts. So, I mean, that ratio itself, um, there's enough justification, perhaps just a little bit of juice in that 15 to 2 price to, to take him on here, or, or to take a chance on him at least. Um, last week in Abu Dhabi, it doesn't, didn't work out. It tends to be the Abu Dhabi Championship, regardless of the uh, cause of the playing, always tends to be a source of frustration for Rory. Was it eight top threes there, four second place finishes? Uh, it was windy last week. He was tinkering with a few of his clubs, which he mentioned in the interview as well, um, which I'm expecting to, he will have either ironed out or he won't be tinkering with this week because this sets up as a far stronger opportunity for him to win, I think. And if you look at his performance last week, he made the cut on the number. He shot the best final 36 holes um, out of the whole field, despite a slow finish on the Sunday. Um, he finished 12th in the end. And, um, you know, had he... Had he put together a good couple of first rounds or, or finish a little bit uh, quicker at the end, then it could have been even, even closer still. So um, despite it not being anywhere near his, his best, he was still uh, yeah, it was still not, not too far away. Uh, two wins here, as I said. He could have had more than that as well if you look back through some of the performances. Two wins at the Earth course, um, at Jumeirah as well, um, not far from here, of course, in Dubai. And it uh, seems to be right back on track now after his uh, his coaching changes. Won the CJ Cup at the back end of last year on the PGA Tour. Sick for the DP World Tour Championship. I think his game has just started to warm up. Um, was he seventh for strokes gained off the two last week? Fifth for strokes gained tee to green. And that was despite nearly missing the cut as well. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm in on Rory. Um, I mentioned earlier um, a double. I've backed a win-only double on... John Rahm and Rory McIlroy, 15 to 2 apiece. The double works out at just over 70 to 1, which I thought, given that those guys are hot favourites for their, their two respective tournaments, you mentioned John Rahm, um, you know, it, it being his absolute best yeah. um, course. They're in Muirfield Village, are his best courses. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So if we're going to see one of these weeks where the uh, the favourites do come to the fore and just just mop up, then taking a seventy to one double on the pair of them to win was uh, and seemed to be the order of the day for me. So I backed that as well. I backed so Rory outright and Rory Ram double for me. And I have backed some each way plays as well. I backed uh, Dean Bermester at fifty to one. Um, nine career wins now for the South African. Two of them in twenty twenty one. He was in some decent form last year. Um, I mean, lots of lower level wins, of course, but he seems increasingly confident at this level now on the DP World Tour. Won the t- uh, Tenerife Open, it was, last year in May, 25 under. That was on Tiff Eagle Bermuda uh, Greens, like we're playing this week. Um, he was fourth at the South African Open at the back end of last, last year. That uh, pushed him up to a world or a personal career best world ranking of 66. We saw uh, Thomas Peters last week, didn't we? He, I think he was 69th going into last week, and he le- leapt up to 31st, I think it was, after his win last week, Thomas Peters. Mm. And uh, you know, someone like Bermester in a very, very similar position can look at that and think, wow, you know, what what can happen from a really strong week in these, um, these big, strong fields with lots and lots of points up for grabs? So a uh, big ca- uh, carrot dangling in front of him. Loves golf in the UAE, seventh in Abu Dhabi back in 2017 on his UAE debut. Uh, fourth, fourth and sixth at the Earth course over the years. Third here also in 2020. He was sick for greens and regulation that week. So ticks that greens and regulation his, history box, which I talked about a few seconds ago. And some really good numbers coming out of his game though. First for strokes going off the tee, a tee and first for strokes going tee to green at the Earth course in November. So topped both of those categories at the uh, the season-ending DP World Tour Championship. 
Um, Abu Dhabi was first for strokes going tee to green, or off the tee rather, fifth for strokes going tee to green. So really good um, long game numbers coming out of his um, of his game last week. 25th overall. That was because the putter was um, particularly cold on the Paspalum greens last week. And I think perhaps going back to uh, Tiff Eagle this week um, is going to serve him well. So if we see a bit of spark of life with the putter for Dean Bermester, Combine that with the fact that he loves playing over in Dubai, loves playing in the Middle East, and his long game looks absolutely immaculate at the moment. Um, 50 to 1 for an each way shot looks uh, looks pretty good to me. Um, as does the price on Adrian Ounce, 66 to 1. I fancied Arn Ounce. I mean, we, we get this all the time as punters, don't we, Steve and Barry? You, you, you're looking at a, an event coming up, you see a player that you think was going to go well, or hopefully goes well the following week, and then you just see him. Uh, stick a ridiculously low round in um, the week before and sort of start to dampen their price off. So uh, when I saw Arnaus 9 under through 17 holes on Sunday, having um, and virtually decided to back him for this week already, it was a bit frustrating. He did double the last to kind of take the gloss off it a little bit, but um, he kind of raised his head a little bit there to... Uh, to see his price get locked down, 66 to 1 now. He was 110 to 1 last week um, going into that event. So there's been a bit of a knife taken to it. Even so, um, well worth backing, I think. Um, he won in the UAE on the Challenge Tour uh, a few years ago. He's been close to winning. He was really close to winning the Spanish Open, wasn't he? Um, it's only that Rafa Cabrera Bayo dodgy drop um, and uh, subsequent playoff defeat that uh, stopped him winning back in the autumn last year and I think his price would have been shorter this week anyway he's got income well, he's got course form of 29th 3rd and 9th so um, that's particularly strong first two attempts in there 29th and the 3rd he was first for strokes going off the tee both attempts he was first for mm. strokes going tee to green fifth for strokes going tee to green in those two events and mm. um, what we've seen since, I mean, we always had him down as a decent ball striker. What we've seen since is that he's become an incredibly good putter. Um, 2020, he was 143rd for strokes game putting. Last year, he was sixth for strokes game putting. I mean, that's an incredible improvement in terms of his mm-hmm. flat stick performance. So putting it all together, if you can get anything like the, st- the strokes going off the tee and tee to green performances that we know he's capable of doing here, Combine that with the fact that you can putt nowadays. Um, Adrian House at 66 to 1 seems to be a, uh, a very good combination. So on House is in, um, same price. Lee Westwood's in 66 to 1. Twice a Rolex winner for Westie. He knows how to convert these events. I don't think he's quite finished yet. Was he 48 now, Westy? I think he's got a year or two left in him before he, uh, he finally starts to uh, slow things down a little bit. Fit as a fiddle, still, I think he's uh, still capable of going out and competing with some of these, uh, some of these boys. And you look at his performance last week, um, and you mentioned to me off mic, Steve, that um, his long game stats last week were really good at Yas Links, um, and they were, weren't they? I mean, tenth for strokes going off the tee, sixth for strokes going approach, second for strokes going tee to green, Mm. really good. Um, twentieth overall for for his first outing of the year. Um, and that was good after a couple of months off. He, he down tools as he always does do um, over the over the winter period, and uh, and came out looking particularly strong. And I think he can push on this week on a course where he's recorded ten top ten finishes over the years. One at the Earth Course as well, one in Abu Dhabi. Um, I don't know. Ultimately, it's going to come down to his putting. But um, again, we were talking off mic. I, I, I think his putting over the last year or so, year eighteen months, has looked far more. Fluid and far better than it has done for a long time. Mm. Um, Tiff Eagle Bermuda seems to suit. And yeah, all, all adds up to a punt on Lee Westwood at 66. Um, finally, one more longer price. Tior Bjorn Olsen, I've backed at 125 to 1. Um, previous Rolex Series winner, previous final series winner when they used to have that on the what was European Tour at the time. Previous Dunhill Links winner. He's won some big events to you, Obi-Wan Olsen. Top 10s at the Masters in the Open Championship. Remember him beating Spieth 5-4 um, and four in the Ryder Cup back in 2018. It seemed like um, you know he was one of these players that was destined to, to really compete at the top before it all, um, all fell to pieces with this well-publicised airplane issue that he had a, a couple of years ago. Um, 
So I won't go into it in more detail. I wonder what you're going to say there from yeah, yeah, so like, you did, I, you did I, well, yeah. I was pick, picking my words carefully there. And it's, it's all been cleared up. He, he's been cleared. Um, the yep. court case has um, been and gone December. He can just get back on with his life now. Yeah, became yeah, a father last that, year. That must be a huge weight off his shoulders. So yeah, he can concentrate on his golf again. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he got suspended from the tour for a while, didn't he? And then got reinstated because the court case was so far in the, in the future. Um, yeah, it's got to be hanging over him. Oh, it must have been hanging over him at the time. But uh, mm-hmm. I think things will start to improve for him. He's, he's a talented player, and I think there's no doubt about that. Uh, became a father for the first time last year. And uh, his golf started to improve at the back end of the year too. He was eighth at the fire course um, over at Jamira, Jamira Golf Estates um, back in November. First for strokes game putting on those Bermuda grass greens that week as well. Uh, shook the rust off last week, played all four rounds. Uh, sick for driving accuracy last week. So the, so the, the driver seemed to be um, playing ball last week. And he loves a bit of desert golf. Four, four top eight finishes here over the years. Um, he used to winter in Dubai back in the day. I'm not sure he would have done this year with the with, with a nipper, um, but uh, who knows? Perhaps he did. Perhaps he came over for some winter sun. Even you know, either way, he loves this kind of uh, course. He loves this kind of golf, and uh, I can see him sneaking into the places this week at 125. Um, so just to recap, then 125s: Thor Bjorn Olsen, Lee Westwood, Adrian Elspeth, 66 to one, Dean Bermester's 50s. Rory McIlroy win only 15 to 2. Rory McIlroy, John Rahm double, um, which comes in just over 70 to 1. If you can pick a couple of of rookies that are offering 15 to 2, the pair of those players. Any fences from you, boys? Barry, yeah. yeah. Barry. Um, I like the Aaron Ice shout. Yeah. I mean, he's been pegged for somebody who's going to break through. Mm -hmm. Um, it just feels it feels inevitable at some you know so let's see what happens um uh, like i said a couple of, was last week or a couple of weeks ago i wouldn't um i expect to see rory win in the next few weeks um th- everything's trending in the right in that direction you know the the little fine tuning of some clubs uh, yeah just and, and all the things you said it just it feels like there's um this could be a pretty big season for rory so um there was one other kind of longer punt um, I might take on. Antoine Rosner. Yeah. Rosner. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but his, uh, his two wins on at this level of the tour have been both in the Middle East, one in Qatar and one in Dubai. Um, I like that phrase, shook the rust off last week. He certainly had a lot of rust because he was way over par, but he finished ninth here last year. And so if he could... If if it was just a rust shaking exercise that was needed, uh, he's available at a hundred to one. So I think I might take a little flyer on that. Mm. Top yeah. eight in the strokes gain total rankings right now with that place last year. Antoine yeah. Rosner. Yeah, yeah. No, he he, he was um, he made my first shortlist for sure, Rosner. Um, yeah, and he, you don't know how players react after their first. Yeah, rust shaker, do you? They, you know, it, it can literally be a case of get that out of your system and then push on from there. And um, it's, it, we often see a, a miscut followed by a really strong performance on the on the second outing of the year once these players uh, start getting their game into sync. So, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I wouldn't put you off Rosner at all. I've gone for three of those deeper prices. I, I managed to scrag Dean Bermester at fifty to one. Mm. For the reasons that um, Barry has already mentioned, new mentioned in terms of his world ranking and stuff like this, um, he's also got a very good desert golf record. Um, I'm also on. I mean, this is a this is a probably a first. I think, isn't it, on the podcast? I'm on Andre Arnous. Arnous. Yeah. So it's he's bound to miss the cut. Um, I've also gone for Lee Westwood. <laughs> We're in serious trouble. <laughs> yeah. Uh oh! <laughs> Sink or swim together, boys. <laughs> the, the weeks were all aligned. It just it just sniffs a disaster. That's I've it. got sixty sixes on Westwood with Betfair Sportsbook. I've got sixty to one on Dreyar Naus with William Hill eight places each way, and I managed to scrag fifties yesterday on Bermester. Mm. So those are my three. Sounds Should be a great like week all, of golf. Yeah, yeah. Sounds like we're all very much aligned. Now, looking forward to this. The two really good 
strong events, aren't they? And, uh, mm. and uh, yeah, some good golf to look forward to. Of course, Wednesday, I'm sure you guys don't need to be reminded, listeners don't need to be reminded, Wednesday start for the uh, the Farmers Insurance Opens. So don't get caught up yeah. on that one. Saturday is my birthday, so what could what could go wrong, eh? I reckon I reckon I'm, I'm going to have someone in contention coming down the stretch Saturday night after celebrating my birthday. Let's hope so. And then, of course, Sunday morning you can watch some more high quality golf coming in from Dubai. So yeah, it should be a great good weekend of golf, I reckon. I hope your bets go well, chaps. Yeah, best of luck, boys. Cheers, guys. Have a great week. Best of luck to all the listeners and the bets. Absolutely. Best luck to everybody. And uh, we'll see you again next week for the Golf Betting System podcast. Goodbye. If you like betting on golf, but everyone that you back misses the cut, get some experts involved with all the stats and the tips and so much more. Cause it's the golf betting system The golf betting system is the golf betting system